Last year at this time, uh, during my class, because of course we didn't have any live events, I zoomed in Scott Pioli. And when I zoomed him in for an hour of speaking to our class, there were students that were completely touched and came to me and came to him, which he'll talk about, but came to me and said, that guy really made an impact on me, not talking about his titles with the Patriots, not talking about football stuff, but talking about life in sports and opportunities in sports. And among them was Jackie Gillen, our editor-in-chief of the Morad Sports Journal. And she reached out, not me, she reached out and said, Scott, would you come down for a day and address our, our symposium? Drop of a hat, Scott's here, no problem. Uh, and so many other students have reacted to him. So thank you. And thank you for your impact so far, even before today on our students. No, uh, thank you. It's, uh, I appreciate Jackie and, and Lily and the other students who you know who you are that reached out. It was a really cool thing last year that got to spend the time and people felt comfortable enough. You know, sometimes you throw out there, feel free to you know, right. reach out, here's the number, here's the email, and they did. So I'm thankful that they did because I'm learning from all of you. And as we did at dinner last night, we continue to learn from one another. So thanks for having me, really appreciate it. I guess we'll start with your background. And I think a lot of people know the football stuff, which of course you can mention, <laughs> it doesn't hurt. Uh, but I think not a lot of people know growing up what shaped you, what made you into the person that you are, and of course your success in the NFL. Well, I, I think as relative to this topic and that we discussed, we wanted to talk about in the class last year, um, the big question was asked, you know, you're an old white dude, why is diversity and inclusion important to you? Um, why do you care about the advancement of women? Why do you, you know, care about the advancement of, of people of color and, and the black community in, in particular? And it's, uh, you know, I'll give two quick stories. I'm a long-winded guy, so put up with me, um, please. The, uh, you know, I had some really interesting and important events very young in my life. And the, uh, I grew up in this town called Washingtonville, New York. And it was a, a community was, that was, you know, founded because of white flight. And my parents moved up from New York City. Dad's from the Bronx, mom's from Queens. And they moved up to this town, Washingtonville, New York, which was a relatively new community. And white flight, for those of you who don't know, was when all of the white people that were civil servants, my, um, you know, city cops, city firemen, union workers, white people, my parents' age were getting away from New York City because, quote unquote, the black people were ruining New York City. And I was born a year later in 1965, and I grew up in this community of people that look like me, look like you, Andrew. And it was a very nice but odd town at times. And when I was eight years old, my third grade teacher, Miss Cooper, um, was our first black school teacher in the entire community, in the entire school district. And to say what, there was a bit of an uproar would be an understatement. All of these families and people and parents who had moved to find a better life for their kids, um, why was this happening in our town? And I'll save you all of this stuff that I heard and listened to as a young child, seven, eight years old, and the words that I heard used by adults, um, towards this teacher who became one, and is still to this day one of my dearest and closest friends, uh, Ms. Cooper's now, Mrs. Jackson. But when it happened, you know, those of us that are around my age, we used to get these letters like two weeks before school started to tell us who our teacher were, uh, who, who our teacher was going to be. And I remember the conversation between my dad and Mr. Vendetti and a lot of vowels in my hometown. And um, when, when the time came for the, to let us know who our teacher was, I found out I had Miss Cooper. And initially to say that my parents were not happy or pleased was, would, would be a safe thing to say. And there's this whole thing put in your head as a kid and you're learning still at seven, eight years old and then when the day comes we've got to go to school and we've got to meet the school teacher and we come off of the buses and we walk up and we go into the line where the teacher's holding their, their name. 
there was this woman who's still, to this day, one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen with this enormous afro. It's 1973. She's dressed in colors that no one else in Washingtonville would ever wear. And as you walk, as we walked up, each one of us, she asked our name and gave us a hug and put us in line. And for the next however many months, every single day, when we walked into that classroom, she had strength, love, compassion, empathy, a physical touch, and I mean that in the kindest of ways, putting her arm around us, holding our hand. Um, and I would say behaved in a way that maybe some of us weren't getting at home in a very uh, blue collar, civil servant type of town. And it was from that moment on at seven, eight years old that I knew that my parents and many of the adults around me were wrong. And that people are people. And um, so from a, uh, I'll cut it off there, but from a racial standpoint, I learned at seven years old how wrong the world could be and how wrong adults could be and how wrong people could be. Because in that classroom, every single day, it was the safest place on the planet. It was the most loving place on the planet. And everything that I had been led to believe up to that moment was wrong. How did you carry that into your aspiring career and career in football? It, well, I made this decision as a, as a kid, right? We all make these kind of weird vows to ourselves. It, I, I felt and said at that point in time, things are gonna be different. If I ever had an opportunity, I'm gonna be an agent of change. And there were very difficult times. As you grow up and you become a teenager, there's moments when you're still in this community where most of the people look like you or look like me, as they did in my community. And the, um, the pressure, the peer pressure of being someone that looks like me to fit in with the 95% of the people that look like me, if you are an outlier, and you're doing that work, you still have to kind of cover your tracks to fit in. And when you're you know, a teenage boy in particular, you don't know how to act, behave. Sometimes you laugh along with the stupid, ignorant jokes. Sometimes you make them just to, again, to cover your tracks because you don't know how to handle, you know, being, you know, be, being marginalized yourself. So, Andrew, it becomes, it, there's moments, there's these moments in life that we all have where we have to either do things to fit in or do things to stand up and do what's right. And I'll sit here and I'll tell you that did I do everything right all the time? Did I behave as nobly um, as I wanted to and should have? No, I didn't. And I own that and I continue to own that and you keep trying to get better. So I carried that forward into my professional life and my work life um, and, and, and I'm talking specifically about race right now but the other thing I know we, we addressed in class last year was gender. And, and, and I'll, before I, I'll, I'll tell the story, um, I've got two sisters that are older than me. And they are better than me in every way. Smarter, better students for sure. They were better athletes. They, they, were, they were better than me in every way. But growing up in this town and growing up where I grew up, and I say where I grew up, I'm not being tough on my town because my town is every town USA. It's every town USA. And my sisters, um, again, were, were better than me in every way. One sister graduated in 1976, so Title IX had been enacted, but it, I mean, it's 50 years later this year and it's still not working right. So as we go through life, I see my sisters have challenges and have to do things uh, different ways, to dream different ways. And as I was growing up, I always had two aces in the hole, my skin color and quite honestly, an extra piece of the anatomy. So what that allowed me was to dream differently than my, sitter, my sisters. And again, they had they were the total package in every way. But when you grow up like they did, they never had the opportunity to dream like I did. I could dream wildly. I was getting bad grades, but I knew that there was a chance at a football scholarship. Um, 
I also knew that I didn't have to behave um, as well as a lot of other people. So anyway, I, I, I wanted to tell that story, and it's, there's much more detail to it, but I don't want to take too much time. But those things in terms of race and gender opened my eyes at a very young age and made me make the decision that I was going to do things differently. So as I, every step that I went along the way, from the moment that I became um, someone in a position that could hire people, I very intentionally and knowingly made sure that I hired people that didn't look like me. Yes, I hired a lot of people that look like, that do look like me, but I also, before it was cool, was hiring people that didn't look like me and giving them opportunities. But it's not just about giving opportunities because there's something going on right now where we're opening doors and people just say, okay, we're gonna give an opportunity to someone. But when we open the door to give someone an opportunity, we need to mentor, we need to teach, we need to be around for those people, not just from a professional teaching and mentoring standpoint, but from an emotional standpoint. Because a lot of people that we bring in to these places are minorities, and they're not brought to dinner. Um, I had a conversation, Lily, I'm gonna embarrass you. Lily, are you in the room? Okay, there you are. The conversation we had last night, where we were just standing there talking, and we observed the room, and how naturally groups of people were getting together, and people weren't intentionally going out of their way to mix. And even though we provide opportunities, I encourage any of you when you get to that position or if you're in that position now to hire people that don't look like you, because I'm looking in this room and most people look like me, it doesn't stop at just providing the opportunity. You have to help mentor people. All right, career part. How does a kid from your town end up with three Super Bowl rings with the Patriots? Mm -hmm. Um, some of it goes back to opportunity. Um, again, same topic. When, when, you, when you look like I look, you get to meet people in certain settings. I got to meet Bill Belichick when I was a sophomore in college. It was actually my second sophomore year. Um, that's kind of a joke, but not really. <laughs> not if you ask my parents. Um, you, you know, you have opportunities to meet people. I met Bill when I was a sophomore in college. We connected, we talked, um, and then I was afforded opportunities because of that. Now, I, I you know, my, when I got done playing in college, I went to Syracuse and got, was a graduate assistant coach, coached for a couple of years, got my master's, and then um, took a job in Murray, Kentucky, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with, you all know Murray State University as a tournament, but uh, went to Murray, Kentucky, which was quite the education. But at the end of the day, you know, when Bill became the head coach of the Browns, he was looking for people like me. He had gotten to, to know me. And when I say people like me, people who didn't care about money, who didn't care about how much they were paid. I was 27 years old, took a pay cut um, down to $16,000 a year. Um, to take a job with the Cleveland Browns and live in subsidized housing. Um, I was a real grown up. And uh, it's funny, we just moved and when I was unpacking boxes, I found this, this old receipt. I saved little symbolic weird things along the way and I found there was the, uh, the check stub from where I received um, assistance from the city of Cleveland for paying for the heat for the winter and housing. Um, so how do you end up there? I, I think it, it's, you know, th this part of me wants to say, pay attention, work hard, learn, do a lot of those things. Yes, I did all those things. I worked really, really, really hard. But I also know a lot of people worked really, really hard and without opportunity, without proximity, without um, some good fortune and, and, and God, things don't work out. So I, I had a lot of good things happen in a, in a strong order. And did you see what you've been talking about throughout your time with the Patriots and other teams? In Opportunities limited. Oh, absolutely. And were you able to change that? Absolutely. Again, um, I think I, I don't want to sound that. I think I've, I've done what I could do in, in my circle, in my sphere. Yes, I saw it all the time. It still exists. Um, 
you know, the first time I was in a position to hire somebody, actually it was the second time I was in a position to hire somebody, um, the first person I hired was, was Jojo Wooden, who, who's with the San Diego, uh, the Los Angeles Chargers now, um, just dated myself. Um, but yeah, I did, and it's intentional, and you have to be intentional, because, because of the, the world that you're in, people are always bringing people to the table to, for, for you to hire. And for the most part, the people that are brought, being brought to me and being brought to others, to the people that are in the positions of, of power, um, the people that have the proximity are people that look like me. So you have to do one of the most important words. I knew I was being intentional, but I didn't use the word. But I know um, years ago, I met someone who talked about the, the power of intentionality and making sure that you go out of your way to intentionally make yourself and others around you uncomfortable. And um, there were times um, I was actually even, I've, I've been called out by people that I work with um, or worked with that understood exactly what I was doing um, and why I was doing it. And they actually tried to call me out. And th th those become very interesting conversations. But the, the work can be so easy if you just pay attention. I was telling someone last night um, in this conversation, they're talking, at, you know, and asking about, you know, women that I've hired to bring into football, into fo direct football operations. And, and I don't know how many people know Katie Sowers. Katie was a coach with the San Francisco 49ers. And, um, you know, Katie got into the NFL and she was with the 49ers during their Super Bowl run. Everyone knows her because that silly Microsoft commercial that, that, that she did, which I love to give her a hard time about. But Katie's path to the NFL or into coaching, she's someone who played football much of her life. She was playing football at the time I hired, we, we hired her. And we found Katie because Katie was my daughter's fifth grade basketball coach. And what happens most of the time is that you're around people and give opportunities to hire people and bring people in. And um, again, it's usually that circle of people that look like you and people don't generally bring you a woman that, oh, she wants to be a football coach. Um, so yeah, I've been doing it. I continue to do it even though I'm out of it now. I have a lot of the connections and I'm, people are now starting to understand how okay it is and it's actually helping them by having a diverse workforce uh, and diverse staff that I'm bringing people to them now. You and I were talking last night. What you're doing, it sounds great and everybody's applauding, but behind the scenes it's tough because as you mentioned, the powers that be kind of like it the way it was. They like status quo. And you've run up a resistance in being forward thinking about race and gender with hiring and with your issues? Yeah, because um, it's right now it seems pretty cool for people to want to hire people and promote the optic that they have a diverse workforce or that they're doing it um, for all the right reasons. But the, the reality is this, people are human and people in those roles of influence, of power, of control, they love the idea, most people love the idea until it becomes uncomfortable for them, until it becomes the moment where they have to sit there and think, okay, I like doing this, this is good, this is good for the culture, this is good for um, diverse thought, this is good for optics, it looks really good. However, at some point in time, the rubber meets the road and you're hiring people or thinking about hiring people that might take your job and you're starting to bring people to the workforce and into the pool that is gonna make it possibly more difficult for you to have a job. And when you, when you do that work, um, for, for some people it, beca it be can become isolating because again, people will wanna say publicly that they believe in it, they want it until they really find out how it's going to affect them and how it's going to affect my little pile of whatever it is I'm collecting or trying to pass down to my son. 
And I know from working in the NFL, when women want to get involved, they are pushed to PR, communications, marketing. maybe finance, marketing. Never, in my experience, football operations. Scouting. Chiefs of staff. Yes. Which is the new term for admin assistant. Right. And, and even on the agent side, women pushed away from that because it's such a male bastion. I commend you, you're changing that. You're changing the thought on that. Women in football and other sports in primary positions rather than support. It's, thank you. I, it, I just, everyone who's here, again, I, you all can't see all of you, but it, there's a clear, um, the audience is, is, is pretty dominant in one direction. Um, you know, there's, there's different reasons that people want to do the work. Um, I did it because I was so affected as a kid watching what happened to Miss Cooper um, and just how wrong that was. That has never left me. I, I do it because of my sisters and watching how wrong it was that they had to do so much more to even have an opportunity, but they never even got the opportunity, including the most important opportunity, which is the opportunity to dream. So you can do this work for a couple of different reasons. You can do it because it's simply the right thing to do. But then as I say that, I want to openly pull those words back because when I say it's the right thing to do, I'm not trying to paint you into a corner and make you feel less than or that you're not doing the right thing. But I do ask you to go back and check and ask yourself in your own personal quiet moment or in conversations, ask yourself, why does someone who doesn't look like me not deserve the opportunities that I have? Why did I win the genetic lottery? Why is that so? Then the other reason that people want to do it and, and took a long time for me to struggle with and is because people say, well, it's a good business model. Um, yes, it is a good business model, right? Um, so if you can't figure it out from a human standpoint and trying to be on the right side of right, perhaps think about the business model. And if you're going to do the work, in which I really hope that some, some folks in here think about it and think about things a little bit differently, understand when you start doing the work, if you start doing it, 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 it does become, it's going to take endurance real endurance, because the easy way is going to be able to allow things to be the way that they've always been. You and I were talking last night, and we both had similar feelings about sort of paying forward after our careers at the NFL. Share with the audience, if you will, standing on that podium in front of, I don't know, 100 million people watching. That wasn't a private conversation. <laughs> Go ahead. It isn't now. <laughs> with Bill Belichick, with... Tom Brady, with, as I said, 100 million people watching. What goes through your mind at that point? So, so the story I told Angela last night was, you know, ever since I was a boy, one of the things I, I wanted was a Super Bowl ring. I wanted to be a, a football player, a good enough football player to make the NFL, get a Super Bowl ring. That was my, I prayed for it almost every single night as a boy. Then you find out you're not a good enough football player. When you, you, you know, you lose to schools like Villanova, you know you're not good enough, which I did when I was playing. Um, Easy now. <laughs> I'm still mad at Coach Tally, by the way. He, he better not be around. Um, and you have this dream, and then you start figuring out, okay, the, the, the player path is not going to work, so I've got to start doing other things. So I become a coach, and then I get in the front office, and there's all these years of praying. And I was very, very fortunate that, you know, I, I was a part of a team that won our first one. Um, I was only 36 years old, but it's all these years of dreaming and you get on the, on the, uh, at the end of the game, you're on the podium and the confetti's going and it's like this unbelievably cool moment that you think is going to be so fulfilling. And it is in certain ways. And then the next year we don't make the playoffs, but then the next year you win a second Super Bowl, two and three years. Then it's the third Super Bowl in four years. And by that moment, the, by that time, the gravity of that moment is really settling in, that you know that you're on this stage with these people. Um, as you mentioned, it was uh, Robert and Myra Kraft, Jonathan Kraft, Bill, Tommy, Dion Branch, who won the um, MVP that year. 
and you're up there, and I was only 39 years old, and there's this conflict now going on in my head, because I was, you know, we had become this machine, and we were doing so well, we had figured a lot of things out, not all of it, but we'd figured some things out, and we were successful, and there was this moment in that third one where I'm looking up, I'm watching the confetti, and I know, as you mentioned, there's tens of millions of people around the world watching this moment, and you've prayed for this, and yes, it's altered your life in certain ways. Um, in other ways, it's not um, all of that. And and I told Andrew, in that moment, Tommy, Tom Brady comes up to me, and he's got these enormous hands. I got to put my hands, my, these enormous hands. And, and Tommy's a really close talker. I don't know if you've seen him when he talks to people. He, he, he's kind of, at times, uncomfortably close. And uh, he grabs my face, and he, he's close talking. He goes, babe, isn't this effing great? And it was this moment, and I just like, the words came out of my mouth that I, I at that moment was the only thing that was on my mind. I was like, yeah, what's next? And it was, it was this moment at 39 years old. I mean, I hadn't lost my stinger. I hadn't lost my competitiveness. But it was this moment where I was starting to think, okay, three Super Bowls, four years, you know, we're, we're still, I'm relatively still a kid in the industry. And people think we're better than we are. People think we're smarter than we are. Um, but it was this moment, okay, like, so what's next? What, what do you do with this? What's the end game? And of course, Tommy's answer was another one, you know, <laughs> the next one. And, and yeah, I was all down for that, but there was also this element, okay, what is the chase for? What is, what is, what's the drug you're chasing here? What, what's the end game? You know, what is the, we talked legacy last night at dinner, like, what is the legacy? And I'm going to actually encourage you to tell your story that you told me now that you did me that way. Um, no, there, there, there's this moment about legacy. What is the, is the legacy really about the number of rings? Yeah, that's really cool. There's a professional legacy, and then there's a human legacy. I'll tell you this. When, I, when my time is done, I don't think I'm going to be asked to check in with the big man with how many rings I got and how many trophies and what kind of pile of money I got. The legacy is stuff like here, getting a chance to sit with this group and... I will say this, I, I, I stopped myself a little because I started to, I was feeling like I was starting to sound a little preachy and forgive me for that. I've got my values, I've got my rules, but I encourage you to think about real life legacy. It doesn't matter, you're building your legacy when you're 20 years old. We don't realize that, we think it's an old man thing or an old lady thing. No, legacy stuff is your life and what you do and how you're gonna impact people. We talked about professional legacy last night, that's cool, but what's your real legacy gonna be? What is the good work? that you're gonna do here that's gonna to matter to future generations. We're, we're here for a blip. We're here for a blip. We all have these platforms or we all will have these platforms. What are you gonna do with them? Andrew, can you tell? <laughs> you're, you're, no, because I, I, I think it's really important. They all know you as Professor Brandt and, and I know Andrew. And Andrew's an amazing guy. Professor Brandt, I don't know, but. yeah. <laughs> I told Scott, you know, we were sharing stories like this. When I was in Green Bay, um, I remember riding around, I was struggling with some contract or some salary cap thing or Brett Favre's annual retirement situation <laughs> or whether we're going to move to Aaron Rodgers or whatever it was. And I'm just in, and I'm, we're driving and my two boys are in their car seats. They're very young in the back seat. And I say to my wife, and she says, why are you so anxious? Why are you so nervous? I'm like, this thing's going on, and Brett, and Aaron, and legacy. And she's like, legacy? That's not your legacy. Your legacy's sitting in the back seat. That's your legacy. And it always continues to, to sit with me. That what we do professionally, I get a lot of attention for what I've done professionally, but you have to pay it forward. That's what I hopefully am doing here. And you have to pay it back. And, you know, on your tombstone is not going to be, you know, he worked all hours at the Green Bay Packers or the New England Patriots. It's going to be what kind of person, father, giver. So I think we share that. 
and the thing is this, I don't want to, I hope I'm not saying this wrong and I don't want to be misunderstood. The pursuit of your on earth personal professional goals and, and, and going after those things, it's important because there's many different parts of your soul that need to be fed. And pursuing those things and having success and working hard and doing a really good job hopefully will give you a platform. But then what do you do with the platform? And what do you do with those opportunities um, that you've worked so hard to get to? So it, 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 there is a selfishness in that pursuit, and that's okay. But there can, there can be a duality of purpose in life. And I have to ask you about the word you use, kind of double click on that. <clears throat> Talking about the Patriots, you kind of threw out the word, maybe unbeknownst to you, machine. What word? <laughs> machine. Oh. And you was a machine, and maybe it is a machine. And Coach Belichick just seems like this ice. And it's all about the next, as you said. Maybe smiles twice a year, maybe? <laughs> That you see. Uh, that we see. Um, and how do you reconcile the way you are, and this is not something new for you, being in the machine with someone like that? It, it, it was fine because, so Bill and I were personal friends before we worked together. Then we worked together. Oh, sorry. Um, we were personal friends before we worked together. So I see a different side of Bill than the world sees. Um, before we worked together, before I worked for him in Cleveland, um, I knew a different side of him. And again, as I was just saying, there's, uh, life has different phases. Your goals in life have different there's, different, there's different seasons in life. And there was a time where I was completely, totally, 100%, absolutely obsessed with success. Whatever that, what it, what success meant in my in my field, um, I'm still that competitive. But as I got older, I was exposed to more things and, and exposed to different things. You know, um, my background is, is different, and I think that's what's you know that's diversity. You know, people can look the same, but we all have different backgrounds. We all have different um, biases. We all have different upbringings and. Um, you know, Bill and I are still and were aligned on a lot of things professionally. How we do things, how we believe, um, some, some of our idiosyncrasies are very much the same. Um, just because you're very close friends with some, all of us have very close friends that, and we, we're close with those people, we believe some of the same things, we have shared values, but the way we do things are, are different and the way that what we need to feed us individually at different times and different phases can be different. I don't know if that's answering the question. Um, Bill and I are, are, are oddly similar in a lot of ways, but we're also different in a lot of ways. But that's why it worked for those 17, 18, years, whatever, however many years it was that we worked And if you had to define the secrets to that success? Um, it would start with focus. It would, um, it would start with focus and it would be part of what oddly, um, it sounds like a contradiction, but a greater good. Because Bill's had incredible success. A lot of that success that he had or has had and we had together was all based on a greater good, right? It wasn't about personal achievement, it was about the team. That whole team thing sounds corny, it sounds cliche, that was a real thing. You were there when we were doing that. That was a real thing. And the focus was on winning a championship that would serve more than just the individuals or the primary individuals. Um, so I, I think that, that focus of everything that you do is done to be successful for a greater good, not to be successful for narcissistic purposes. And I have to bring up again Tom, Tommy, 
Tommy. Or as they call him yeah, up. Yeah, I knew he wanted to use Tommy. I don't know who this Tom guy is. They call him up He's there, Tommy? Gonna... Tommy? <laughs> How do you not have a Boston accent all those years? I grew up a New Yorker. And... <laughs> right. What did you see there? I mean, my it's interesting seeing Tom the past couple years in Tampa. It almost seems, and check me if I'm wrong here, he just seems a little more free. He's all over social media. He's playing with people on social media. Where in New England, he was pretty buttoned up. Mm -hmm. You saw a different side of that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I saw a very different side of that. Um, meaning the, the, the non-buttoned up part. Yeah, because right. I knew him when he was a scrub, right? And, and, <laughs> and was part of the group that drafted him. So that's why he's Tommy, right? He's just this guy. And um, life changes you know, celebrity changes, but he's still the same person. Um, it's, it's like any workplace. He was more buttoned up because those, when you work there, w you know, we collectively, Bill, myself, the Crafts, Ernie Adams, Bears, all the people, a million names you all don't know that were so critical in terms of creating that culture. When you work certain places, if those are going, those are the rules of engagement. And part of the rules of engagement were that you didn't, you never did anything that could possibly um, go against the team or harm the team or that was about yourself. And part of that was, I think, um, not being out. The, the more opportunities you take to be public, to be in the media, to be in social media, there's a chance that a mistake can be made. And part of our culture was, if you weren't doing something for the greater good, there was really no need to be doing anything. It's, um, you know, as, as my mind's going 100 miles an hour, much faster than I'm speaking right now, and it's just, there was, um, there was something incredible about it, and at the same time, there's something that's borderline dysfunctional about it. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen it. I mean, in dealing with Favre and similar situations, there's a there's a one focus intensity that can block out a lot of things and block out some other issues as well. Yeah, and it's funny because you knew me during that time yeah. and during those years, and you know you have to suppress not not because someone's telling you to. You just know for this greater good and to help other people, to help the team, to help the company, to help the, that you have to suppress certain selfish behaviors and, um, and everything that you do, again, is for the greater good. And you don't want to take the risk of compromising what's good for everybody else by doing something selfish. So spinning to the present, Scott, you're on NFL Network, people see you, you have a nice platform. You're obviously skilled at media and bringing insights from your past into, into media. What's your real goal? What do you want to do now? Talk, you talk about gender and race equity. I want to educate. I want to, and again, not because I'm smart, because I'm not. I'm experienced. You hit a certain age and, and people start to think that because they have this experience, they're smarter than they are. And, and I don't kid myself, I, I know what I am. But I do have stories, I have experiences, I've seen a lot of things. I've been blessed to see a lot of things that other people haven't seen. I've been blessed to see them through a prism or a lens that other people maybe haven't slowed down to take a look at. Um, the goal is to, to share a lot of these experiences, to talk with people, to mentor people, to help people. Um, I'm so hopeful for, you know, I've got an 18 year old daughter and I'm so hopeful for people her age, younger, and the age of the students that are in here that you all are gonna be so much better than our generation is, right? That's, we all hope the next generation is better. So to share some of the, you know, we've talked about a little bit some of the successes here, but I have had some epic failure too. I really sucked at my job at times. I've gotten fired and there's, there's learning in that. You know, this is, it, I've done some, I've done a lot of wrong things. And taking those moments and just sharing them with people, the end goal is to, to leave, leave whatever little part of 
the world that I'm uh, that I've been a part of and can be a part of a little bit better. That 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 that's my personal end game. You know, I really do this, but I know he's making a big impact with you guys out there. I'll take a couple questions if you have them, Mike. And let's welcome Mike Missanelli, ninety-seven point five. Mike, I've made, I've made, uh, we're making eye contact here, and I'm figuring you. You're, well, So um, the Rooney rule, G going back to it, this is, so I, I talk about the, the Rooney rule from a historic perspective, and, and I encourage many of you in this room, um, here's what the Rooney rule was. It happened at a time because it was a reaction by a bunch of people that looked like you and I, who for in a moment they were either in trouble, it was costing money, it was costing public image, and, and or good old fashioned guilt. So we rush out and we create this Rooney Rule, which is no different than Fair Housing Act. Um, historically, our country and the leaders in this country, what we've done, if we go back and look over every time in history, including the 60s, including we create laws, policy, programs that are reactionary to try to fix a problem that's there, but we put it in place, we say, okay, here's this great law, here's this great rule. We put it in place and then we walk away. And we don't watch, or we choose to not pay attention to closed loopholes when they're found. Because there's always people that are out there finding loopholes, circumventing policies, circumventing things, doing things to undo the rule, the, the, the intent of the rule. But the Rooney rule really hasn't been readdressed for over 20 years maybe slight tweaks, but everyone knew what was going on, but we chose to ignore it. And again, I bring that up because you look at our government, you look at this country, that's what we, we, we historically, that's what this country does. We say we're gonna help black people and we're gonna change things, and we're, gonna, we're about equality, we're gonna, you know, whether it's voting or whether it's housing or, or in, in, with women. I mean, in 1974, women couldn't get a mortgage on their own in this country. That's in my lifetime, I know. But some people in here in 19 said they couldn't get their own mortgage. They had to have a signature of either their spouse. If they weren't married, they, you know, they had to have uh, their father take care of it. We, so we, we change things, but then we don't continue to look at things. The Rooney Rule is a perfect example of that, where we created this rule. The optics were great. Here's what we're going to do, but it didn't change anything. Anytime we create policy or a rule or, or, or something to make a change, we have to keep it living and breathing and checking on it. And we chose not to do that. So the only way to do it now is to almost go into affirmative action. And I'm curious to know how you would feel, how the NFL would feel about that, because the public, the white public, you may rush against that. What, and and what, I'm not going to speak for the NFL uh, um, because I can't. But something's not working, and what I f what I feel we need to do is if we're going to say that we're going to make change and we're going to be about change, let's really do it. But again, change is hard. And what happens is the people who say that who are at the top making those changes, as I was speaking about earlier, everyone says they want change until the change affects them. What's the quickest way to get there? There is no quick way to get there because it, we, there's so much that's got to be. The, the, if if I had the answer to that, I wouldn't be sitting here. Um, the The answer is, you know, staying on top of it and doing the only the only time I think that real sustained change happens and comes is when you do it from the heart, which is why I believe in trying to find ways 
to change people's hearts. And the way we change people's hearts is through real understanding and real education and real, honestly, confrontation, what the truth looks like. I think there's a lot of people out there that have biases and have, they're either sexist or racist until they're confronted with what that truth and reality really, really looks like. Because otherwise they live in this bubble and they don't know um, what the um, outcome of their ignorance is. Or they choose, they either choose not to do it or they've never been confronted what the outcome of their ignorance so looks like. Would you be in favor of rewarding a team with a supplemental uh, Personally, uh, I, no. A, a, a black head coach, black general manager, uh, a woman uh, front office person? Personally, no. And because I don't, and this is my personal feeling, the fact that we would have to incentivize people to do just what is humanly right, quite honestly, is a little sick. So, and, and I know that goes, and I know that goes, you know, I'll, I'm gonna hear, hear from people in making that statement, because I just found out, by the way, this is being recorded before we're going on. Um, <laughs> and someone's gonna be tweeting this. But no, but I, I don't, I don't, but that's me personally, right? I, that, that, those are my values. I don't believe we should have to incentivize people to just do the right thing. To treat women with respect, to allow black people to have the same opportunity as me, we have to incentivize. So we're, we're actually what you're doing by incentivize is you're doubling down on your privilege. We're gonna give someone additional privilege if they do the right thing. I mean, that, that's warped, in my opinion. It is warped, but it might be necessary. I hope it's not but we're take, already doing it. <laughs> take one more, yep. Wow, um, I'll, I'll say this, there's been, there were, which is why I circled back on the point, I've had epic failure. I think the most public failure uh, was getting fired in Kansas City um, from the Kansas City Chiefs. <sighs> what, I, and, and I'll be honest, I've had more failures and more, or just as many failures as successes. The, Trying to th which one was like life changing? I I'll, I'll say th there's so many of them, and they happened at much younger ages. But at, at, when I was younger, I was a little bit um, bullheaded and ignorant to why they were happening, wh why the failures were happening. So I, you know, had that mentality: fight through it, fight through it, fight through it. And that in, in itself was a failure. I think. Um, the failure in Kansas City was, was a pretty life-changing failure. Um, I bless you. There's much other, other ones that were a lot less public that I could sit here and explain, but they probably wouldn't make sense because you know sometimes those failures can be so personal, just like some of the successes can be very personal. But failing in Kansas City um, and the circumstances surrounding it um, when it happened, a little bit of what we talked about last night, um, made me fully stop. And I think that's one of the mistakes that, that many people make um, and I was making. I knew I was making mistakes, but you're trained as a former player and, 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 a, and a football person, whether you become a coach, keep fighting through those mistakes. Okay, mistake, acknowledge it, move on. I think in Kansas City, I took a full year of not working in football. Um, and really drilled down on some of the mistakes and failures. Communication, I was, I was doing, I was doing a good job of communicating in some spaces and, and with some people, a horrible job in other ways. Um, there were so many things to that job that I feel like I wasn't doing well. 
uh, without boring you with the specifics, but I think it, it was communication. I think it was the enormity of the job. I think I was, I, well, I know I was micromanaging a lot of things um, because you get to these roles sometimes where you know that you're gonna be held accountable ultimately and you know that part of the reason you got to the job was the fact that you could do certain things. You find yourself micromanaging people in roles that you've tried to empower, but then you're not, you, yes, you've empowered them, but then you meddle in their business, which I was guilty of. Um, it, there's, there's a lot of little things there. I think, um, you know, trust had become an issue, and th that's a dangerous thing. And some of the trust issues that I had were real, and some were, were not. So I, I don't know if that answers your, your question at all. But I'm going to be around the rest of the day. I can tell you, and I'm not being funny here, there's a lot of failures, a lot of failures, starting at a young age, that I'd be more than willing to share because um, there's a lot of growth and failure if you're choosing to own your own hot mess. You're welcome. I have never met a highly successful person without a lot of failure. I think you've just seen why Lily and Jackie and others said, when we form a symposium, let's get this guy. So much more than Super Bowl general manager. Let's give our appreciation to Scott Pioli.